realistic watercolour landscape painting. That's what we're doing today. I've got six of my best tips and techniques for you. Welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Michelle and on this channel we do all things watercolour, including colour mixing, techniques and a little bit of mixed media too. Please do consider subscribing. If you click the bell icon, you can get notified every time I have a new video for you. I make one free video a week here on YouTube with extra content on Saturdays for my Patreon subscribers. So today I'm going to talk about six of my favourite tips and techniques for landscape painting and um, we're going to talk about them but I'm also going to show you these tips. Now two of them are specific painting tips, I'm going to show you how I do them with a brush but also we're going to talk about some broader principles of landscape painting and drawing so that you get that realistic look that you're looking for in your own work. So the first tip I have for you which I think actually is a good tip for any medium including crafts and any subject and that is to work in a limited palette. Now some people have trouble understanding what a limited palette might mean and I'm going to show you in practical terms in a minute. But also other people think that working in a limited palette is boring, it's going to lead to dull work and that you don't have fun and that you can't experiment. Well nothing could be further from the truth. Now I'm not saying that you should own just a few colours. Now some artists do work in this way. I've known oil painters for example that just own eight colours and all their paintings are done within those eight colours. That's fine if that's the way they want to work. Now I really love colour. I've never seen a colour I don't like. I want all the colours in the world. I want to own them all and keep them all in my studio. <laughs> this is why I'm not rich. So when I say working within a limited palette I only mean within each painting. Now it's easy to do this and it doesn't have to be a fixed formula. Now I did do recently a, uh, a sunset tutorial for you that chose the four colours that we were using in advance. But I'm talking about a much more organic way of developing a, uh, a limited palette as you work through your painting so that you don't introduce unnecessary colours and so that all of your work is bathed in the same light. Because if you look at any landscape at all it will have a certain theme to it, a certain light to it. And if you just keep randomly dipping in and out of every colour that you own, and this is uh, particularly important for pan painters, if you've got pan paints rather than tubes, the temptation just to dip in and out of every single colour is overwhelming. I'm going to show you a better way of working so that each of your landscapes is harmonious while still being colourful and each one can be as different as you like. So let's look at what it means practically to work within a limited palette. Now this is only a small palette here and this contains my essential set. So these are paint colours that I designed in collaboration with Jackman's Art Materials in the UK. This set has just been launched, we're taking pre-orders now. So if you are interested in these paints do have a look in the description and you'll be able to find out all about those. But the principles I'm teaching you in this video will work with any brand and any colours. So you can see I've got this basic set here, I've got some earth colours, I've got some primary colours. And this is where we're going to start now. All you have to do when beginning your watercolour painting is to, um, to choose the colours which seem most appropriate to you. For instance, you might match the blue to the blue that you see in the sky and you might go on from there. Now imagine you choose a blue for your sky, so let's watch one of those. Here I've got some phthalo blue green shade makes quite a nice sky blue. So what if after swatching my blue sky I then need some green from the foreground? Now what I'm going to try to do is not to mix it from an entirely different blue, just something randomly from my palette, but I'm going to see if I can take that blue and add some yellow to it. Now this is not to say that you can only use one blue for your entire landscape painting or one yellow, but it's just the idea of not introducing other colours until you need them. So let's put some Hansa yellow with that. So Hansa is similar to lemon. Now we can see I've got some green appearing there. What about if I use the warmer yellow? This is diarylide yellow. Now we can see I can get some warmer greens. So here already I've got quite a, uh, quite a range of colours and only by using two yellows and one blue. Now if you've got blues and yellows and then you add the third primary which is red or pink then you've got a lot more options as well. So perhaps when I'm painting my blue sky, I have a little bit of this pink down near the horizon. So I'm starting to get more colours in here. So what if I now need a grey? Well, of course, I can use this one here. This is Payne's Grey. This is a great colour. 
But if I keep adding more and more colours, I can end up with a painting that's not very harmonious. So before I go into a ready-made grey, I'm going to see, can I mix a grey from these colours I've got here? Now, if we mix the three primary colours together, we can get a grey. So grey is just three primaries with an emphasis on blue. So let's start with the blue and we'll put a little bit of Hansa yellow in and then we'll put a little bit of pink in and mix, 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 and we can start to get a grey. And we can push that in any direction. We can make it a green grey, we can make it a lilac grey, we can make it a blue grey by putting more of those colours in. So it's just this idea that before you add extra colours, consider if you can mix from the colours you've already got. Now we have some earth colours in this set as well. So here I have burnt sienna. So I'm not saying that you should mix all of your neutrals from primary colours. That's not what I'm saying at all, because look at this lovely bright colour here. It's pretty much certain that we wouldn't get a colour as vibrant as that if we mixed it from the three primary colours. Lots of the earth colours are single pigments, they're natural pigments, and you just can't reproduce them by mixing your primaries together. But it's just this idea of not introducing too many other colours. So we might, for instance, introduce this colour, and then we've got a whole range of other colours that we can mix from there. Look at that, so I've mixed that into my grey, and now I've got a cool brown as well as a warm brown. So the best way to manage this within your own painting is to just start with the colours that you think are naturally in the landscape and that you're naturally attracted to, a few primaries perhaps, one or two earth colours, and to write them down along the side of your paper. And before you go into any new colours, see if you can mix what you need from the colours you've already used. If you can't, then fair enough, add another colour. But what this does is it stops you getting 20 different colours in the same landscape and everything being a little bit disjointed, rather than that harmonious look where the whole landscape is bathed in a similar colour palette. So the next thing we're going to look at for realistic landscapes is perspective. And I'm not talking about the kind with vanishing points and mats and, uh, and angles and all of that scary stuff. I'm talking about aerial perspective. Now, if you haven't heard of aerial perspective, you still will understand it because it's the principle that things appear to be bluer and cooler and softer and less saturated as they go into the distance. So if you live in a mountainous area, you will have seen this time and time again. When you're out walking, you'll look at the distant mountains and they'll be much softer, much paler and much bluer, or perhaps even purple, than the ones that are close up to you. Um, if you live in a city, it's a little bit harder to see, but if you go out into an area like a parkland where you can see a little bit more of the sky and you look up at the sky above your head, and then you look at the sky out in the distance by the horizon line, you will notice that the sky above your head is darker and stronger in colour. Now what's happening here is that as you look into the distance, you're looking through all sorts of things. You're looking through pollen, you're looking through dust, you might be looking through pollution, um, just all those tiny little things that float around in the air, water vapour, and this appears to your vision, and I say appears because it's not reality. If you walked to that place, it would be just the same colour as, you know, the place you'd left, but it appears to be bluer and softer and cooler. It's a wonderful thing for artists because it can allow us to give a sense of distance in our paintings. So I'm going to point the camera downwards now and show you some practical ways of incorporating this into your own work. So let's look at the three basic principles of aerial perspective. Now we know from ordinary traditional perspective that things get smaller into the distance. Now aerial perspective tells us that they also get cooler and softer and less saturated. So we can use this within our own paintings. One of the most effective ways of doing this is to lighten things as they come down to the horizon and go into the distance. So we're talking about things getting paler in the distance. So if, for instance, and we'll do sort of a, a tiny mini landscape here, if, for instance, I start painting my sky, it's a nice blue sky because it's a summer day, then maybe I'm going to make it much paler as it comes down. I might also add a touch of pink, and that will actually physically cool the colour down. So you can see here how to get the sense of distance within the sky. Now what about the foreground? Now as well as being lighter, Colours are cooler as they're further away. So let's start our foreground, and I wouldn't normally be letting one bleed into the other, it's just for demonstration purposes, but let's start our foreground here by using some Hansa yellow, and we'll add a little bit of the blue into it there. 
And what about coming forward, I start adding this warmer diarylide yellow. I could even go into a different blue. This is French ultramarine and get a lot more warmth coming forward. So we're looking at things being warmer as they come forward, getting cooler and lighter as they go away from us. And that would be the, the horizon line. So you're going sort of strong to weak, weak to strong. You're also adjusting colors. So warmer colors are close to you. That's here and up here. And the cooler colors are further away from you. Now, another thing to think about is clarity. So things that are close to you should never be less sharp than things that are further away. And this is a mistake I see sometimes people make, is that the grasses and things that are up close to them are not very sharp at all. And yet halfway up here, they'll have things that are really sharply delineated. So remember that the closer things are to you naturally, the clearer you will see them. And so you want to get things that are further away, softer, and things that are closer up, more hard edged and sharper and having more clarity. Now, one thing to point out at this time is this is just a basic underlying rule. This does not go for every single landscape and every single situation. For instance, I was out walking one day. It looked it was a lovely summer day, but it looked like it was going to storm. And there was a big load of strong black clouds down by the horizon in the distance here. So um, it's not an exact rule, but your underlying landscape should follow these proportions. Even if there are one or two elements within your landscape that don't follow this, and an example might be, for instance, there might be some fields of lilac growing right up close to you. Lilac is a very cool color. So it doesn't mean that you have to follow this rule rigidly, but overall for your general landscape painting, you should make sure that things get cooler and softer and less clear into the distance, even if one or two elements within that painting might naturally break those rules. Now my third tip for you is both a drawing and a painting tip and this is always to be aware of the horizontal and always to ground your paintings and come back to those horizontal lines. Now it's true that sometimes you might have curved lines in a landscape, you might even have things like mountains that certainly don't lay flat. But overall you are trying to trick somebody into thinking that this 2D thing is 3D, that they can walk in, that they can feel the earth underneath their feet. And there's a temptation, I think, to, uh, to draw angles that are too steep and lines that curve upwards too much. So I'm going to show you how to not only to draw your landscape with this sense of flatness to it, but also how to apply the brush strokes. Because, for instance, if you're painting a sky, if you stick to um, horizontal brush strokes as you put your sky in, and one of them isn't quite right, you get a bit of a drawing line, it's horizontal, it's not going to look too bad. Now imagine if you're painting your sky the other way, you're going up and down, you end up with a vertical line in the sky. It's not going to look realistic at all, you're just not going to get away with it. Same comes with things like pathways, and um, particularly I see this with still water, people not getting this idea of the water laying flat in the landscape. So I'm going to show you a few basic techniques to ensure that you keep the horizontal, you keep the grounding within your landscape so that it looks realistic and so that things aren't tipping up towards you and so that people feel that they could just walk into your landscape and have a stroll. So let's start with looking at drawing. So if I draw a horizon line here and let's think about a path or perhaps even a river going into the distance. Now look at the difference. If I draw my river like this, it appears to stand up and come towards me. So what I want to be doing is going back to the horizontal. So you can see how by emphasizing the horizontal and you might have sort of banks that sit along here, although you have still got some curves within this landscape, you're going back all the time to the horizontal and that's really important because what that does is it enables your work to lay flat. So perhaps you have some water with some ripples. Again, you're looking at doing them horizontal rather than sketching them like this. It's such a simple thing, but it makes all the difference. Again, if I'm going to put a sky in, I want to be using horizontal brush strokes. At this point, if you're getting some value from this video, can I ask you for a favor? Could you please click the like button? YouTube rewards channels with audience interaction. So if you like, share, subscribe, or leave me a comment, YouTube will push this video out to more people. This week I hit 20K subscribers. I'm so grateful to all of you. Please could you click the like button for me? So again, going this way and coming down. Now say I don't do such a good job of this and I end up with one or two straight lines. 
it's not the end of the world, right? Because often you get skies that are like this anyway. Now imagine if I'm doing some other thing, it's going to look awful. So I want you to always consider coming back to the horizontal. This applies as well if you're working on your foreground, always going back to these horizontals. Now some landscapes are flatter than others, but if you have still water in your landscape, it has to lay flat. That doesn't mean that the curves of the riverbank might not come around like that, but generally speaking, it has to lay flat. So I want you to always consider going back to the horizontal within your landscape painting. So my next tip for you is to mix your colours on the paper and not on the palette. Now occasionally you may need to advance mix a, uh, a colour before you apply it to your paper, it's absolutely fine. But for the majority of time, landscape has a lot of texture and you're missing out the qualities of watercolour if you mix everything first and then apply it to your paper in just a simple flat colour. Now with other mediums such as oil painting and acrylics, we can add texture by brush strokes. This doesn't tend to work very well with watercolour. So with watercolour, we tend to use things like techniques to add texture, but there's one very simple way of adding texture without using any of these techniques whatsoever, and that's just to mix your colours on the paper so they're not completely flat and boring and even. So I'm going to point the camera downwards now and show you how it's done. It's fantastic for foregrounds this, it's absolutely wonderful for mixing greens but you can do it with any colours that you're using in your landscape. So let's imagine the foreground of a painting and here I've got some ready mixed green. I just mixed it up from some yellow and some blue in my palette. Now if I apply it well I can get a smooth effect. That's not going to be very realistic for a landscape. If I apply it badly, chances are I'll get some strange backgrounds and drying lines that won't look very realistic either. What would be far better is for me to take the colours that I used here and let's think about adding those directly onto the paper. Now this, if you're a beginner this can seem really scary but you have to realise that basic science says that yellow and blue make green. You can't put yellow and blue on your paper without them becoming green, so you have nothing to worry about. So I'm going straight in with the yellow here. It's got a touch of blue in it because I just had some on the palette there. So I'm going to go in with my yellow and let's add blue straight to it. And here we go. Let's get more of the yellow. Maybe actually I want some warmer yellow too. Perhaps we are, as we talked about earlier, going into warmer colours as we come forwards. Again, I'm using the horizontal marks to place these things on the paper. And because it's a foreground, I can allow some uneven drying. Now, can you see the difference between doing this and doing this? So much more interesting, so much more texture going on on this side. I can also, if I want to, manipulate it further by dropping little bits of wet paint or water in and causing some backgrounds we can actually get some bushes and things growing in our landscape but even if all I do is pop the colors directly on the paper look at the variation I get never be afraid either to leave things completely blue or completely yellow you will have heard of pontillism where people put individual colors in tiny dots on a painting because further back your eye mixes them together so you're an artist not a photographer you can get away with leaving patches of pure blue and patches of pure yellow and look how much more interesting and how textured this looks compared to the colour that we just pre-mixed and placed on the paper. So my next tip for you is using watercolour pencils within your landscape painting. Now lots of you love watercolour pencils, I've done full tutorials on watercolour pencils on this channel, it's really really popular. However, one of the best uses for watercolour pencils is to use them whilst you're using paint to draw into wet paint with them. I've done other videos on this subject and really popular on this channel. So I'm going to show you now a few ways of using watercolour pencils within your landscape painting. They are really, really a simple, easy way of getting detail and texture much, much easier than using the brush. So I've got a few watercolour pencils here. Now watercolour pencils in a large set can be quite expensive. You can actually buy them individually from most manufacturers and from most art places online. You can buy single watercolour pencils, which is really wonderful because if you just get, you know, one or two greens, maybe a grey and a couple of earth colours, you'll be well on your way to adding some nice details to your landscape painting. So let's go back into these areas that we've done here. Now when using them in landscape painting they do work best actually if you work onto, uh, onto wet paint with them because they'll release a lot more pigment that way. So if you've got anywhere that's got fault lines or cracks or anything like that you know these are great techniques. 
particularly good for rocks and things like tree bark. You can get all sorts of textures going on here. Not quite the right color here, is it? But you can imagine if I'm using brown or gray and then working in so I can make tree bark. If I've got um, a rock and it's got a crack on, I can get that crack in like that. Or maybe it's a paving stone with a crack in. The other thing I can do is use it for texture and for grasses in landscapes. So let's go into this one here again. Put another layer of colour on. Now perhaps I just want some darker areas so I can work in like this. Again, defaulting, generally speaking, to horizontal marks. And I can get some really interesting lines there. If I've just got something like a patch of dark grass in the distance, or the hint of a pathway, I can use watercolour pencils. Coming forward, if I've got stuff that's closer to me and I've got some grasses, this is one of the best ways of making soft, natural grasses in your landscapes. I've used this for reeds as well, in yellows and colours like that. So you can go in and you can use multiple colours. Got quite a sharp pencil there. I'm flicking upwards and outwards. So watercolour pencils, absolutely fantastic and quick for adding details to your landscapes. So I've talked about the technique of mixing colours on the paper to get texture and of course there are lots of texture techniques that you can use in watercolour painting. One of my other favourite ones for landscapes is splattering with a toothbrush. So I'm going to show you how it's done. I'm going to show you a method of doing it so that you're not covering yourself in the splatter or the wars. It is possible to control where it goes. And um, it's fantastic for things like beaches, for things like woodland pathways. Anyway, you've got lots of small speckles or lots of small stones, even things like concrete. Fantastic texture technique. I'm going to show you exactly how to do it. So how do we splatter to add texture to our landscape painting? You're going to need two things. You're going to need a toothbrush like this. The scruffier it is, the better. I got one of these toothbrushes that had the kind of the zigzag. This was the type that I used to use before I got an electric toothbrush. So they already had sort of uneven bristles. And of course, you can see that it's been all sort of, you know, bashed up and messed around with. And so it's become very textured and very stiff, great for splattering. The other thing you're going to need is some newspaper. Now, um, anybody that follows me on my Facebook group will know that I have just moved house. So I haven't got any newspaper to hand, but I do have this very nice um, IKEA self assembly unit. Now, safe to say I have already made the unit, so I don't need the instructions anymore. IKEA instructions are always a bit of a laugh anyway, aren't they? So what you're going to do is get your newspaper or your magazine paper and you're going to mask off any areas of your painting that you don't want splattered. And I mean any, the whole painting, all of the areas you don't want paint on, you're going to cover them up. Now, I wouldn't actually stick the paper to your painting, but what you can do is you can kind of do an almost like a patchwork with bits of masking tape and so that you can sort of stick the paper to itself and to the board and things like that so that you're not actually risking tearing your paper, but you've got everything sort of um, nicely flattened down. Now, what you want to make sure is that the edge is torn. Now, if you had a straight edge like this and you splatter, you're going to see very strongly. It's like using a stencil. You're going to see that edge very strongly. So that would only be appropriate if you did have something very, very hard edged. For instance, you had a wall in your painting and the edge of the wall was dead straight. You could, of course, use a straight cut edge there. But chances are you'll be using this for something like a beach or maybe a pathway. And you want the edges just to fade out to nothing. So you want a torn edge like this. So let's mask the area out. And often you can get some nice curves there as well. So I've been fairly angular with this, but if you've got sort of a curved pathway, do just tear your paper in, in gentle curves. It doesn't have to fit the edge of your pathway exactly. Um, as long as it's curved and raggedy, then it's not gonna show. It's just gonna blend in naturally with subsequent layers. What you're going to do then is get your toothbrush and your paint. So I'm gonna dip in a bit of water and pick up some paint, and then I'm going to splatter. As with any other technique that I show you on this channel, if you haven't done it before, do practice before putting it on your painting. Now, you might think that you have no way of telling where the paint's going to go, but actually there's an easy way of controlling this paint. So the first thing I'm going to do when I splatter is I'm gonna make sure that I point down towards the board. This will stop it just going forwards and you know over my table, or if you're in an art class, you'll be splattering the person opposite. That kind of thing doesn't tend to go down too well, I have noticed in my own classes. The other thing you're going to do is you're going to um, apply your thumb like this. Let's see if I can get it on the camera properly. And you're going to pull backwards. Now, if you pull backwards like this, 
the splatter will go forwards. So if you're pointing down at your paper, the splatter will go forwards and away from you and down towards your paper. Now, if you have arthritis and you can't do this, what you want to do is get yourself a flat blade knife. I'll use a paintbrush here just to show you. And what you would do then is you would get the knife on the base of the bristles and drag backwards towards you and use the knife to flick if you can't manipulate your thumb in that manner. So safe to say I don't normally use this on white paper. I would, of course, in a landscape painting, have put a layer of color down first and allowed that to dry. So for example, on a beach, you might put a layer of beach color down, again, dropping maybe one or two different colors in at the same time so you get a little bit of texture already, let it dry, and then you can go on top with your splatter. So we dip in, and I'll pick up a little bit of Payne's Gray first of all because it's a dark color and you'll be able to see quite easily. And then you're going to point down towards the board and drag your thumb backwards. So paper's a little bit wet there. I've got some one or two bigger bits, but really don't worry about that. So, and then we're going to go in. I've got some, mix some yellow ochre in now, and we can get this natural effect going on. Now, along with your splattering, you can also use the idea that things get smaller as they go away from you. And you can go in and actually paint with the paintbrush, especially when you get a drip like this, it enables you to just break things up a little bit. Now, if any of those marks end up looking not particularly realistic, you can also go in with a brush afterwards and turn them into perhaps more pebble shapes. This is a fabulous technique for working in layers. You can also use it with masking fluid. And of course, you can use it with opaque pigments like gouache. I do have a full beach tutorial for using this technique, and I'll link to that in the information cards up above. If you can't see it there, do have a look in the video description. So removing our mask paper, we've now got this lovely area of texture to include in our landscape painting. So do let me know in the comments which of these you found the most useful. And if you have any of your own tips or techniques that are favourites of yours for landscape painting, do share those with us as well. Now, if you have enjoyed this video and you're quite new to watercolour painting, you'd like some quick wins, some easy tips that are just going to help you to level up a little bit quicker, you might like my watercolour do's and don'ts video. You can watch it now right here.